need a worthy title, I don't know whether you know what you're in for, but here are the names and the titles I'm going to speak about tonight. Um, the, one of the names is Elohim, and another one is Yahweh, then we have El Elyon, the Most High God, El Shaddai, El on its own, Adon and Yahweh Tzvaot, uh, Yahweh of armies. That is the order in which they, cre they uh, um, appear in the scriptures. So the English name God has really not much more meaning than good. And then uh, I know some good people, they're not called God. But if you use the name Elohim, then we got the plural name. It means the angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. And so we have got a, a wonderful um, set of names here, and they appear in this particular order. In Genesis chapter 1, we have the name Elohim. The name Yahweh appears in Genesis chapter 2 for the first time. Uh, the name the Most High God occurs for the first time in Genesis chapter 14. And the name God Almighty, El Shaddai, you find for the first time in Genesis chapter 17. And then Yahweh Tzvaot, Yahweh of Armies, appears in the first book of Samuel for the first time. So you wonder then why God is introducing himself by different names. Now, the name of God is Yahweh, and it means he will be. So if you go to Genesis chapter 1, in Genesis chapter 1 it says in verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the word God is in the plural. It's gods, or rather the angels, which are God's fingers, as it were, who did his creation work for him. But the word created is in the singular. So, grammatically, it is not very sound, but in the beginning, the Elohim, he created the heavens and the earth. They only did what God himself commanded. So the verb is in the singular, but the executioners of that work, of that will, were the many angels who must have rejoiced to do God's work. The same name Elohim is also used for judges or for mighty beings. Now, first of all, I should say that the names which you see here are Hebrew names. And it's good if we know a little bit about the significance of Hebrew names because they are so expressive. So if you have names like Adam and Eve and Abram, Sarah, Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob and Rachel, these are all Hebrew names. And when God created Adam, after all the animals were created, he let all those animals pass by Adam to give them a name. Well, how would you go about doing that? Here comes an animal said, give it a name. Well, I don't know. Well, give it a name. That's interesting. Um, so Adam himself, his name is Adam. Uh, Patrick, can we move the, the, um, the projector slightly? You can see the one on, on the left as well. The one on the right is just cut off a little bit. See, why did God call Adam Adam? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Because Adam came from the Adama which is the ground or the soil. So God called the first man he created Mr. Soil because that's where he came from. Uh, the word the soil is the red soil, the terra rossa, as you can perhaps see on this picture here, because red means Adam. And we are only alive because of that red fluid that goes through our veins, that is dam. So you see, all those names are related. Now, and then he called his wife. Give her a name. How do you do that? You've got a beautiful woman there standing in front of you. But God says, well, give her a name. Well, she became the source of all life. And in Hebrew, because I'll come back to this later on, um, to live is chaya. There are three letters, the ged, the yud, and the hey. 
So what Adam did, he changed that middle letter from Gaia to the Vav, which is Gava. So by changing the small letter Yud, Yod of the Yod in the title, the small letter Yud, he changed into the longer Vav, and so his name was called Gava. But it comes from the verb to live, so she became the mother of all living. But then, yeah, a leopard came by, how do you call that? Well, Adam said, he flew spots, I call him Mr. Spotty, no man. That's very expressive. And then he saw lions, well, it looks a bit like a leopard, but it isn't, so then lions start to talk to Adam, he said, Arie! He says, well, okay, your name is Arie. <laughs> so he gave him the name of the sound which he makes. And then a donkey. What does donkey say? Gamor, Gamor. So he called him Gamor. That's the name for a donkey. And the snake came by and said, Nahash. Okay, so you make shh. I call you Nahash. So he used the sounds which those make. A bird is called a tipo because it goes chip, chip, chip. And you see, the, mean, the names have a meaning. A, a bee makes honey. A, a bee is called Deborah, Devorah. And a bee makes honey, which is a type of the word of God, according to Psalm 19 and 119. So, davar makes davash. And so we can see that the word for word, the word of God, davar Yahweh, is related to the bee who makes honey, which is a type of the word. And you can play around with these words. It's very beautiful. And especially, why would God change people's names? Because it's a change in the life of that particular person. Abraham was first called Avram, it means exalted father. Av means father, Ram is exalted. But Avraham becomes a father of many nations after God has given the blessing that in the so all nations be blessed. So he changed his name. His wife Sarai was called Sari. Abraham said, well, she is my princess. But after Abraham became the father of all the faithful, she became the princess of all the people. So she's now called Sarah. And then we got that beautiful type of, of Joshua. His name was changed from Hosea to Jehoshua. But what does that mean? Well, his first name, Hosea, means being saved. He was in need of salvation. And so we all need to be in need, we all in need of salvation. The Lord Jesus Christ need, needed to be saved from death also. And only then can you become a Jehoshua, a one that can save other people. So they're fantastically interesting meanings. Naomi that means pleasant, but after she came back, she called the name Mara, which is bitter. <coughs> The apostle Saul was first called Saul, and then his name was called, turned into Paul. Why again that change in name? Well, Saul, or Sheol, means the grave. And he persecuted all the believers unto the death. But then his name was changed to Paul, the Hebrew word for a worker. Nobody worked harder for the truth than the apostle Paul ever did. So in Genesis chapter 1 then, in the beginning, Elohim, the plural form, he created the heavens and the earth. It's a plural name, it means mighty ones. And it comes from the singular Hebrew word is El. And El means power. You see, we call him God Almighty, but it's the power, the almighty power. That's how God expressed himself for the first time in Genesis 17. When Laban pursued Jacob uh, and overtook him, he said, it was in the power of my hand to do you hurt. That's the same word for ale. So we got ale, the singular form, expressed in a multitude of angels that did this creative work, and they are called Elohim. Because the angels, as we read in Psalm 103, they are uh, God's angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his, of his word. So they did exactly what God told them. Because God himself could not come down to the earth because the, the outraging power of God would just consume everything. So he sent the angels as his instruments, but it was God who created 
the heavens and the earth. The other one was just her uh, ministers. And then in chapter 2 of Genesis, if you go to uh, verse 4, so in chapter 1, when you read God, it's always Elohim, the angels who did his work. Therefore in verse 26 it said, let us make man in our image. The angels formed Adam out of the clay and then breathed in the breath of God. But in verse 4 of chapter 2, after we read that the whole heavens and the earth were finished, they said, these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that Yahweh Elohim made the earth and the heavens. So why does God introduce himself by his name Yahweh for the first time in chapter 2? Well, Yahweh means he will be, we should later on when we come to Exodus chapter 3, he will be mighty ones. Now he couldn't say that when the plants were created or the fishes. God doesn't want to be a multitude of fishes or plants or trees or lions or leopards. No, he wants to be a multitude of mighty human beings. So only after Adam and Eve were created did he introduce his name of Yahweh. So it was done not before the end of the six days, because it relates to people. And, but only in the time of Moses, as we read from Exodus 3, was that name for the first time manifested. There's something interesting to see how Eve understood the meaning of the name Yahweh. We know from 3.15 that God had said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, or it shall bruise thee first, and thou shalt bruise his heel, or afterwards. Because Eve had sinned, and Adam agreed with her, they were expelled from paradise. But God had promised a seed of the woman that would overcome and undo, as it were, <coughs> what was done wrong at her instigation. There is a fantastically interesting verse in chapter 4. In chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. No, she didn't. She didn't say that. Although we all believe that Whatever happens in our life comes from God, but she got a baby from Adam, didn't she? And she didn't say, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And he would say, I have gotten a man, Yahweh. That's what she said. Because she believed and hoped that her son, the first seed of the woman, would rise up and undo what went wrong in the Garden of Eden and overcome or bruise the result of the seed of the serpent. I've got a man, Yahweh, all her hope to go back to paradise, she invested in that child. But when she saw him growing up, she must have realized that he didn't have the right character to overcome the seed of the serpent. And in verse 2, it's so sad to read that. She again bears his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Why do I say it's so sad? Because Abel means vanity. When you read in Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanities, is Abel of Abel's. By calling the second boy vanity, she must have realized that none of her immediate children would be that Yahweh that would undo or overcome the seed of the serpent. So it's very sad that, you know, despite the disappointment, we can see that her understanding was that Yahweh was going to be a man, one of her own children, flesh and blood children, who would deliver all mankind from sin. And we know, of course, that it took 4,000 years for Jesus to be born, the true bearer of that Yahweh name. It was not until the time of Moses 
that the full meaning of the name Yahweh Elohim, used in Genesis 2 and verse 4 for the first time, was uh, manifested. So we just read that when Yahweh saw that, he, that Moses turned aside to see that bush that burned, God called out of him out of the midst of the bush, he said, Moses, Moses, here am I. He said, draw not nigh hither, put of thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. And then later on we read in verse 13, when Moses said unto Elohim, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, I shall say to them, The Elohim of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is the... What is thy name? What is his name? What shall I answer them? Now, if you go to um, Exodus chapter 3, then I hope you still remember how names were made. But go first to Exodus chapter 3, and in verse 14 and 15, it says that Elohim said to Moses, he didn't say, I am that I am. He said, I will be that I will be. It's not I am in the Hebrew. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I will be <coughs> has sent me unto you. And Elohim said moreover unto Moses, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Yahweh Elohim of your fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, and the Elohim of Jacob has sent me unto you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. To understand the meaning of the name Yahweh, and to understand why God said, I will be, instead of I am, we need to remember, first of all, you remember how the name of Eve was made? Then we got a verb called Chaya, you take the middle letter, the Yud, and turn it into a valve. Now, in Hebrew, the verb to be is haya. There's three letters, he, yud, he. If you want to make first person future tense, you put the letter, the aleph in front of it. Ehie is I will be. You put the taf in front, tehie is you will be. You put a little yud in front of the haya, it is he will be. That's how you work in the grammar, very simple. You get a three letter verb, you stick a letter in the front of it, it becomes future tense. If you stick different letters at the back of it, it becomes past tense. So when God says, I will be that I will be, or ehie, asje ehie, he uses this form. It doesn't mean I am, but it is ani. <coughs> means grammatically, I will be. It says, I will be that which I will be. That's the true meaning of I am that I am. But if somebody says, well, I will be, what are you going to ask? Well, what will you be then? Ask a little boy, he said, what will you be? Well, I said, I want to be a doctor or a professor or a train driver or whatever. There's a sequence, a question, I will be, I'll be what? And God answers that question in the next verse. So what does God want to be? Well, one thing is sure, he doesn't want to be alone in the heavens all the time. Although the angels are there. So first of all then, how is the name of Yahweh made? Well, he will be, minus the yud, in front of the verb, haya, ye, he, ye, means he will be. It's just a grammatical form. We say three letters, three words in English, he will be. It's only one word in Hebrew, ye, he, ye. If you do the same trick, as it were, as Adam did, by changing that middle yud into a vav, then ye, he, ye becomes Yahweh. And it is God's name, Yahweh. It's a private name. It's the name of God. But it means he will be. Just like Chaya, to live, is Chaya. Chava is Eve's personal name. But it comes from to live. So when you talk about the name Yahweh, it means he will be. Is that kind of clear to everybody? 
If you don't understand, you just ask a question. You know, I don't mind being interrupted because if you don't know Hebrew, it may be a bit hard going. But this is so important to understand this. You see, in Christadelphia, we don't use the name Yahweh always. And I can understand it because sometimes people force it down your throat, as it were. I would never do that. I would never force people to say Yahweh. Although I don't want to be hindered in using it myself. But I do think that every Christadelphian should understand what Yahweh means. Because it's God's memorial name. This is my name forever. How can you believe in a God and you don't even know his name? There may be Bank here. Do I call you Mr. Banker? Or do I call you Brother James? Whatever. So God, that is his, his job. So he needs to be good. That's what God is. But his name is Yahweh. Now, once you understand that Yahweh means he will be, then let's look at those two verses again. I've color-coded them because those two verses, 14 and 15, are set in parallel. So God said to Moses, I will be that I will be. And then he said, say to the children of Israel, I will be has sent me unto you. Of course, I got to ask, well, who will he be then? So he <coughs> asked it. You see, the ending of verse 14, has sent me unto you, is the same as the end of verse 15, has sent me unto you. It's the same person, same God. So in verse 14 says, I will be, but what, what will he be then? Yahweh Elohim. That means, he will be mighty ones. That is the meaning of God's full name. He wants to be mighty ones. Uh, um, he wants to have many people that are like him in character and in deed. And he's going to give them eternal life in the future. Then they'll be truly mighty ones. So he will be mighty ones of your fathers. The mighty ones of Abraham, the mighty ones of Isaac, and the mighty ones of Jacob. This is my name forever, says God. And it's my memorial unto all generations. We can't ignore that. If God says, this is my name, well, you'd be better understand it and, and use it if we can. I don't like to be called uh, Mr. Teacher. My, my name is Lane. So God is, you know, he's good, but his name is Yahweh Elohim. And it expresses the whole purpose of why God has created the earth. He will be mighty ones. Who? All the ones who have believed in the promises which God made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Because if you believe that, and put up the character of God, there will come a time we will be raised from the dead and elevated from mortality to immortality, and then we'll be truly sons of God. Shema. Just, just a minute before this comes. So, if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And that's right for us, Jesus was the greatest commandment in the law. After Moses, in verse 1, God told him, These are the commandments and the statutes and the judgment which Yahweh, your Elohim, commanded you to teach you in the land where you go to possess it. And in verse 3, Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, that you may increase mightily, as Yahweh, Elohim of your fathers, have promised you in the land that flows with milk and honey. Then it says, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh, our Elohim, Yahweh is one. And you shall love Yahweh, your Elohim, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words which I command this day shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently unto thy children, and talk of them when you sit in the house, and so on. So he was told that there is only one God, and his name is Yahweh. Now this verse is an extremely important one for the Jewish people. They say it every day, at the morning prayer, at the evening prayer, when a Jew dies, these words are on his dying lips. But he won't say Yahweh, of course, they say Adonai instead, and this is how it sounds. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, 
Adonai Echad. So they say Adonai instead of Yahweh. But that expresses the whole being of God, as it were. Yahweh, our Elohim. Because if you believe in the promises to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, he's our Elohim. Yahweh is one. Now the Jews won't say it, but it's so important for them that they know it from, well, they, from the time they can speak. The interesting story that after the Second World War, um, some rabbis went to monasteries where they knew Jewish children had been taken in and educated as Christians. And so they went to, that, uh, to the abbot of the monastery and they said, well, have you got Jewish children here? I said, no. Well, well, what about these names then? Oh yeah, those children are there, but they're German names. So they had to go away. They wouldn't tell them they were actually Jewish children whom they were raising up as Catholic children. So the rabbis thought, well, what can we do? So they came, they asked to come back one more time when the children were going to bed. And so when the children were going to bed, they said this verse, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. And some of the children broke down in tears. And they said, oh, mommy, mommy, they remember from being so young that they knew this verse by heart. And they could pick out who were the real Jewish children. Yahweh our Elohim, Yahweh is one. And we are told that we should think about that name. In Malachi 3.16 it says, They that feared Yahweh spake often one to another, and Yahweh hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written for them that feared Yahweh and that thought upon his name. How can we expect to have our name written in the book of life if you never bother to think about the name of God, his great memorial name, in which all our hope is embedded because that book of remembrance must be the same as the book of life. And Jesus, Jesus used that great name of Yahweh Elohim to describe what is the greatest commandment of the law. But the scribes came and asked him, what is the first commandment of all? And he said, hear, O Israel, Shema Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, Yahweh our Elohim, Yahweh is one. And at another time, he was asked to prove the resurrection of the dead. He said, now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush when he called Yahweh the Elohim of Abram and the Elohim of Isaac and the Elohim of Jacob. For he's not the God of dead ones, but of living ones, for they all live unto him. You see, once you're baptized, then we are the children of God. We are Elohim already now. Or it's not manifest what we shall be. That will come after the resurrection. But Jesus proved, he used these verses to prove the resurrection of the dead. Because once you become an Elohim, you become part of God. He can never forget you. He will remember you and raise you from the dead when the time comes. There's one difficult verse, perhaps, in uh, Exodus chapter 6 you may have wondered about. If you go to Exodus chapter 6, so Yahweh said to Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong arm, with a strong hand, shall he let them go, with a strong hand, shall he drive them out of his land. And Yahweh spake to Moses again, I am Yahweh. And I appeared unto Abram, and unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by my name El Shaddai, God Almighty. But by my name Yahweh was I not known to them. How is that possible? Did Abram not know about the name Yahweh? How <coughs> Eve knew all about it? It doesn't say so in the Hebrew, actually. God says, I appeared unto Abram, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by my name of God Almighty, we come to that later on, but by my name Yahweh, made I myself not known unto them, I have not manifested unto them myself as Yahweh Elohim, that came for the first time, the first manifestation of the name <coughs> Yahweh Elohim, he will be mighty ones, 
is when they came out of Egypt, when they crossed the Red Sea, they were baptized under that cloud and into Moses and entered into the desert. He explains in Ezekiel chapter 20, I wrote for my name's sake. Because for the first time, we have Elohim, a whole nation coming out of Egypt. Among whom they were, in whose sight I made myself known, same as here, in bringing them forth out of the land of Egypt. So Abraham knew the meaning of the name of Yahweh. He was looking forward to it. We are in one son. So now you get a whole nation, the Elohim, the mighty ones, coming out of Egypt. That's the first time that God made himself known by his name, Yahweh Elohim. But we must press on. Oh, one more thing about the archaeology. The name Yahweh is so important. See, the oldest scripture we have is in the Dead Sea Scrolls, about 2,000 years old. But it found the name of Yahweh written, dating back to the time of King Hezekiah. See, in Jerusalem, there's a particular <coughs> Scottish church, and in the ground they found a cemetery from the time of King Hezekiah. <coughs> They used to lay the body out, here was the head, the body this way, head, body that way. Five people could be laid out of here. But underneath there, there was, <coughs> perhaps you can see it, <coughs> a blocked up cave. The way they buried people in the time of Jesus, the person dies, and then they uh, wrapped it in linen clothes, and they laid out the body on a shelf like this. So this is a family tomb, it's about seven places. But what do you do? It's a family tomb for generations. What do you do when number eight dies? You've got to make room for the body to lay out. So they take the bones of the oldest person and put it in the cave down below. That's what the scripture says. Somebody died and he was buried laid out on those benches and then get it unto your fathers there's a big pile of bones there down below with the personal jewels and they found among those jewels a little silver scroll that was rolled around very tightly with a hole in the middle hung around somebody's neck it's been rolled up for 2700 years so the silver was so brittle it took a long time to unroll it but when they did they found written in ancient Hebrew the blessing of number six. Yahweh bless thee and keep thee. Yahweh make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Here you can see the name in ancient Hebrew written Yahweh. So they knew that name already 2,000 years ago. In Genesis 14, what happened in Genesis 14? No, Kizadek, no, right. So there was a, in Genesis 14, we have the whole long story about those kings coming down Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariel, king of Elasa, and they made war with the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma, and Zebuim. And then in verse 18, we read for the first time a new name of God. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the, the Most High God. Oh, why change his name? Or have an additional name? The Most High God, El Elyon. Now we have this invasion coming from the north, those kings of the north coming from Mesopotamia, going down on the east side of the Jordan, going down into the Negev, and going to Hazison Tabor, and then there was a battle with the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. They captured Lot and made all the way back to Lasha. And these are the names Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elasa, Kidaliome, king of Elam, Tidal, king of the nations. And they made war with the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zebulun. So they served in 12 years and they rebelled in the 30th year, 40th year they came down to take revenge. Remember that those kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fell into the slime pits? Well, we, we see them again today, since 2009. We see those sinkholes, their clay pits, just as they were in the time of Abraham. But why does God himself 
call himself suddenly the Most High God. But the names of those kings, they were named after their gods. You see, Amraphel means El, El heals the people. He was the king of Babylon. So he's an El from Babylon. Ariok means lion, the king of El Athar. He was a lion like king of the El of Assyria. So get an El of Babylon, an El of Assyria, and a Kid and then Tidal, Tit Al, the knowledge of El, king of the nations. So got three gods here being introduced into the promised land for the first time. So there, in Mesopotamia, there's a pantheon of which a little image, the Eucharistic pantheon, Eo, he was the chief god, like Zeus was the chief god of the Greeks. You see him here sitting on a throne. And he had children. Baal, for example, he was the son of Eo, the Phoenician sun god. They found here this, this wooden plaque and here a statue of Baal. He was the storm god, the bringer of rain and fertility to the land. So it was a drought, you pray to Baal. That's why, for example, Elijah, Elijah in that contest on Mount Carmel, he said, call upon the name of your god, and I will call the name of Yahweh. And the Elohim that answers by fire, let him be Elohim. And all people said, it is well. Why did he ask? Well, let you go bring down fire, because that is what Baal used to do. But it was a drought, they asked, they prayed to God, hoping the thunder of a cloud will come, there's lightnings, and you can see him there standing with a lightning bolt in his hand, and then rain will follow. So there was a whole pantheon of gods that they believed in, and therefore God says for the first time here, I am the Most High God. Up to that time, God was the only God people knew. But now new gods are introduced, and God says, I am the most high God. And you can read through the scriptures where this name then appears. But now we go to El Shaddai, God Almighty. Genesis chapter 17. God introduced himself by another name. When Abel was 90 years old and nine, Yahweh appeared to Abraham. But he's still Yahweh. But now he says, I am the Almighty God. I am God Almighty. El Shaddai. Now we've seen then that a, a, a name of God has got some to is the way he manifests himself. How does he manifest himself in chapter 17? There are four distinct things that are happening. Uh, first of all, in verse 1, he says, I am El Shaddai, therefore, because he's called that name, walk before me and be thou perfect. That's a direct result of the name El Shaddai, God Almighty. See, Shaddai is derived from Shad. It means to destroy, to scatter, but also to nourish. A woman's breast is called a Shad because it gives milk to nourish the baby. A field is called a Sadeh because it brings forth uh, fruit. But devils are called Shadim, they're destroyers. So how can God be both a nourisher and a destroyer. Now God only nourishes after things are destroyed. How can we walk before God and be perfect unless we destroy the old man in ourselves? And then he can renew the inner man. So four main events. Walk before me and perfect. The next one is the sign of the circumcision. Then Sarah shall bear a son, and then the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. The elements of destruction and nourishment we can see in all this. Now, walk before me. Well, Noah, he was a just man and perfect in his generation, and Noah walked with God. Just as 
the Almighty told Abram to walk. Well, he walked with God. He didn't follow after the flesh, but he was totally in tune with God and so directed his life. Abram, we just read this, walk before me. And he says, walk yourself. You must do it yourself to want to walk before me and be perfect. <coughs> Samuel, as a young boy, he said, I will raise up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in my heart and in my mind, and I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before me, before mine anointed, forever. And David also, the fortress the, with Goliath, he brought in the ark, he was playing the harp, he says in the Psalms, Thou hast delivered my soul from death, Thou do not deliver me, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living. We can only walk before God in the light of the living if you put the old man to death. Then he can nourish the new man. The two go hand in hand. The second element in chapter 17 is the covenant of circumcision. It means the cutting off the destruction of the flesh. Again, cutting off the old man... <coughs> So it may live in newness of life before God. It's the sign of the covenant between me and you. It's a sign. A token is the word for sign. It means something. Not a little bit of skin they cut off. No. We must put the old man to death. So God can nourish with his word the new man. Look at a fantastically beautiful example of the, both the destructive power and the nourishing power in verse 10. Look at verse 10, look at your Bible <coughs> of chapter 18. The angel came to, to Abram, to the three men, and in verse 9 they said unto him, those three angels, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold in the tent, he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent, door which was behind him, and they were both stricken in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old and have pleasure, my Lord also be, uh, my Lord being old also. And therefore the Lord said unto Abram, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Surely of, uh, of a surety bear a child, when I'm old. And then God says, Is there anything too hard for Yahweh? Of course it is too hard for a woman who is 80 years old to give birth. It's quite impossible. It would be the end of the woman. Now a woman can give birth when she is in that age, say between 18 and 50, uh, just a number. Yes, but the angel never came back. It doesn't say in Hebrew, "Surely I will return unto thee." The word "return" in the Hebrew is "restore." Mm -hmm. He said, "Actually, I will certainly restore unto thee the time of life." Now, the time of life for a woman is when she is fertile and can bring forth children. Because after a certain time, it cease, it will cease, like with Sarah, to be after the manner of women. An 80-year-old woman cannot give birth. But God restored her to life again. He destroyed the old Sarah, and he restored unto her, unto her the time of life. Abraham and Sarah were renewed. They were made young again while they were still alive. Because Abraham said, my, husband, my Lord being old also. But after Sarah died, he married again and had six more sons. They experienced in themselves the new life of the kingdom age. They were changed from two old people to two young, young people. So that Isaac could be born. Now, that's a destructive power. Destroy the old body, but then he can give you a new body. That's what happened to us in the kingdom as well. So that is the power of El Shaddai, of God Almighty. But if people don't repent, in chapter 19, we read about the destruction of Sodom. We're excavating that at the moment, and we found 
a meter thick layer of ash and destruction. There's the destructive power of God. He got overthrew those cities. See the wall here? It was blasted so <coughs> and the bricks all tumbled down this way. And on the bottom we found skeletons of people that were thrown to the floor. The flesh consumed away while they were standing up. They fell down in all sorts of terrified positions. This is the wrath of God Almighty if you don't repent. So we can see that God manifests himself by different names at different times to teach us very specific lessons. Then you go to Samuel chapter 1. That's the last name we were dealing with tonight. Chapter 1, there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim, Mount, of Mount Ephraim. His name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of To, the son of Zeph and Ephrathite. He had two wives, the name of the one was Hannah, and of the other was Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto Yahweh of hosts, <coughs> Yahweh of armies. A new name used for the first time in the Bible. So he went to sacrifice unto Yahweh Tzvaot, Yahweh of armies in Shiloh. And his two sons were priests there as well. So why does he suddenly become now Yahweh of armies? Or what the Hebrew actually says, he will be armies. But the word for armies or hosts is used for the first time in Genesis 2 and verse 1. Just the heavens and the earth were finished and all the, sorry, it kind of blackened out, and all the host of them, all the armies of them. Because the stars in the sky, well, we hope to be like that, the future armies of God. And then all the stars in their constellations are types of the future army of God who will help Christ rule the world in righteousness as kings and as priests. Next time we read in Joshua chapter 5. It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold to the men over against him which is sword drawn here yeah, in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, Are thou for us or for our adversaries? He said, Nay, but as the captain of the host of Yahweh am I now come. He was the captain, the general commander of the army of Yahweh. Now, who would he have commanded but the army of the angels, that mighty heavenly host? They are like an army. Can you imagine that this crossed the river Jordan? The manna ceased and they ate now of the land. They circumcised everybody. They kept the Passover. And now they were ready to conquer the promised land. And the almighty general commander of the arms of heaven comes down to Joshua, tells him what? Take your shoe off. Do we need a commander of an army to tell you to take your shoe off? He says, Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and told him, What says my Lord unto his servant? And he says, Loose thy foot from off thy ground, for the place where thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Somebody was told to do the same, remember? What was it? Moses. Moses. I suppose if I were Muslims, when they go to a mosque, to take off their shoes. Why did Moses have to take his shoes off? And why does Joshua have to take his shoes off? Just because the ground is holy? Does the ground change from sand into pearls? Why was the ground holy? Why did he have to take his shoes off? I'd like you take, to go quickly to Deuteronomy chapter 25. We read from verse 5. 
If bread and dwell together, among them die, and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her, and take her to him for wife, and perform the duty of her husband's brother unto her. It shall be that the firstborn which she bears shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, and that his name be not put out of Israel. But if a man does not like to take his brother's wife, now let his brother's wife go up to the gate of the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stand to it and say, I will not like to take him, then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of his elders and take his shoe off, loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face. I shall answer say, so shall it be done unto that man that will not build up his brother's house. His name shall be called in Israel, the house of him that has his shoe loosed. Maybe it's in Israel, uh, my wife and I, in a little house, but she rented from uh, an Israeli couple. They were actually Russians who uh, survived the Second World War, came walking from Yugoslavia all over Russia into the land. They set up a little farm there. They had two children, two boys. And just before we rented the house of one of the houses, um, the elder son died in a car accident. He was just married six months earlier. That I sad, um, but the woman was left alone. But a few years later, his younger brother wanted to marry his girlfriend. He went to the rabbi and said, oh, can you arrange a wedding? Because I want to marry this woman. He yeah, said, no, you can't. I said, why not? I said, you told me 25, you got to marry your brother's wife. And the first child that's born, that is your brother's child, so his name will continue. Well, that wife, that widow, didn't want to marry him, and she was quite happy for him to marry his girlfriend, but had to go to the rabbit, stand both, I mean, the younger brother and his sister-in-law, before the rabbis, they read this out, and she had to spit in his face, and he had to take his shoes off. I well, didn't like doing it, so gave him a little dribble on the stick. But without it, they couldn't marry. So if you don't want to redeem your brother, you take your shoes off. So why does Moses have to take his shoe off? Why does Joshua have to take his shoe off? Because they were not the redeemer. There were types of the redeemer, but God himself, he was the redeemer. I will bring you up out of Egypt. And Moses was just an instrument in his hand. Moses was not the redeemer. Joshua is not the redeemer. What did John the Baptist say to Jesus when he was baptized? I am not worthy to undo the latches of his shoes. Because Jesus kept his shoe on. Because he was the redeemer. So there's interesting information there. So, and then we read about Elkanah. Uh, going up out of the city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto Yahweh of hosts in Shiloh. Now, of course, it was David in 1 Samuel 17. And you go to 1 Samuel 17. 1 Kings, is it Samuel 17? But David and Goliath. You had a contest between the Philistine, Goliath, and David, because nobody else was brave enough to take on the Philistines. Not going through the whole story. But verse 44, the Philistine, Goliath, said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air, and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of Yahweh of armies, the Elohim, of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will Yahweh deliver thee out of my, into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thy head from off thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is an Elohim in Israel. And so we have here David proclaiming the name of Yahweh of armies. And that's why in the book of Samuel, we have there for the first time the name of Yahweh of armies. 
and certain people were absolutely convinced of that. And Hezekiah was surrounded by the Assyrians. He said, be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed of the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him, for there be more with us than with them. Elisha also, when he asked the boy's eyes to be opened, he said, the, compass, the city was compassed with horses and chariots. And what shall we do, said the little boy? Fear not, they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Now, of course, the Israeli army called themselves uh, the army. Tzava, that's the word Yahweh, Sebaot, Svaot. That's the word Tzava, the army for the protection of, of Israel. And on all their tanks and all the cars, they've got a little Tzadi there, El Tzvaot. Uh, I'd like to conclude with Revelation chapter 2. So if we overcome, like the El Shaddai, if we destroy the old men in ourselves, then God will nourish the new men, and we can become part of the armies of God in the future. Chapter 2 and verse 26. He is a promise to them who overcome. Verse 26. He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end to him will I give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, as a vessel uh, of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I have received of my Father. And so, in conclusion, Psalm 149, because we have here an invitation to belong, to belong to the mighty armies of Yahweh. Psalm 149. They've got a description of what the saints will be doing in the kingdom. Verse 5 of Psalm 149. Let thy saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of ill be in their mouths and a two-edged sword in their hand. To execute vengeance upon the nations, punishment upon the people. To bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. To execute upon them the judgment ridder, dishonor have all his saints. Halal ye ya. So we can belong in the future by the grace of God to a new army who will impose a new order on this world which is full of troubles as we all know. So then let us then nourish that new man by reading the word of God every day and then we've got a wonderful future laid up for us.